Resident Evil was a groundbreaking game, more or less creating the survival horror genre. It changed the expectations of what people believed games could be in the fifth generation of game consoles. So, understandably, expectations were high for its inevitable sequel, the most anticipated sequel of its era. When Resident Evil 2 released in 1998 on the PlayStation, it blew everyone's expectations out of the water. Resident Evil 2 expanded on most of what made the original game great, but made significant changes that I feel are missed. Let's take a look at Resident Evil 2. First, let's take a look at the controls. Resident Evil 2 inherits the tank control scheme from its predecessor. This style of controls maps the character's movements directly to the D-pad. Pushing up on the D-pad moves the character forward, regardless of what direction that character is facing, as opposed to mapping movement based on the perspective of the player. As with the first, this is a somewhat necessary move due to the static and cinematic viewpoints. Every room has several cinematic camera angles in which you switch between as you move around the 3D space. The tank controls keep the character moving in the same direction as you switch perspectives. This control style is hated by some, but I've never had much of a problem with it. After the first 10 minutes of playing the first game, more than two decades ago, I got used to it. Even after not playing a classic Resident Evil game for several years, just like riding a bike, I was able to pick it up again with only a few seconds of gameplay. Still, Resident Evil 2 being a more action-focused game than Resident Evil 1 does show a few more flaws in the tank controls. Narrow corridors and greater number of enemies highlight the weaknesses of the inherent lack of agility that you have with tank controls. All versions of this game feature an optional auto-aim feature. The auto-aim is an extremely useful tool as it not only lines up for optimal shots, but actually allows a quick method of telling if a zombie is actually dead. However, unlike with the first game, with the greater number of enemies which can appear in an individual room, the chances of being swarmed are increased. With the increased instance of swarms, the chances of auto-aim targeting the wrong enemy is also increased. However, it still rarely presents as much of a problem for me. A feature which helps with the enemy swarms is a stagger which you can inflict on zombies when using the pistol. When being swarmed by enemies, pistol shots have a chance of knocking zombies backwards, giving you much needed space in between you and the enemy. Like in the first game, there are numerous enemies which are not necessary to kill. Most enemies are positioned in narrow corridors and small rooms which require their death to maintain safety, but several enemies can be avoided completely provided the player has the necessary mastery of tank controls. Again, as with the first game, boss battles can be frustrating. The first battle with William Birkin is especially frustrating as you both have to maintain distance and keep up your attack. The 2D backgrounds and 3D characters return, much improved from the first game. The backgrounds feature a limited amount of animation. The limited animation, such as fire or mobs gathered around lamps, adds a bit of movement to the backgrounds. There's no mistaking the fact that they are in fact static backgrounds, but these animations add a little bit of extra life to the environments. The bigger improvement comes with the character models. Be it improvements to Capcom's engine tools, better programmers, or a better understanding of the PlayStation hardware, the character models look significantly better. Characters feature either higher polygon counts or at least better character modeling. They also feature more detailed texture mapping. This does not come at the expense of enemy count. In the first game, there was a limit to four character models in any particular room, the player character and three zombies. When four zombies are required, such as in the underground lab, different simplified models were used to increase their count. In Resident Evil 2, the game features as many as seven in some rooms. These zombies look better and have a greater variance in appearance than in the first game. They also feature better and more dynamic animations, giving them a more mobile feel.
Resident Evil 2 features a slightly more complex story than its predecessor. There isn't some great mystery to be solved, you already know where the zombies came from. What replaces is a bit more of a personal story. The characters in the first game were shallow avatars for the player, which go through with no character arcs or development. Just like how the game series grew up a bit, with the sequel evolving the mechanics of the first game, the character arcs of Leon and Claire are about growing up. Now let's start with Leon. Leon has a bit of an inconsequential backstory of him breaking up with his girlfriend and drinking himself into a stupor before heading into Raccoon City. None of this matters. Nothing matters until Leon arrives in Raccoon City itself. The only real characteristic Leon displays is some sort of cop-like mentality, just in a kind of cartoony way. This results in him coming across as a bit of a goody two-shoes. We can't stay out here. Head to the police station. It'll be a lot safer. The majority of Leon's interactions are with Ada Bomb. Her rather obvious deception goes completely over Leon's head, making him seem somewhat naive. Wh what are you doing? You know what this is about, so just hand over the G-Virus. The character arc shows Leon being nudged towards being a bit more of a cynical person by the end of the game. This hardly seems like a standard character arc for a character to have, but it does represent a bit of maturity. Leon kind of starts out as a kid, full of optimism and unrealistic trust in the goodness of humanity. Then life kicks him in the face and sets him on a course to becoming the wisecracking asshole we come to know in Resident Evil 4. Sadler, you're small time. Oh. <laughs> Rive in my cage of torment, my friend. Claire starts out the game as just a teenage girl looking for her brother, Chris Redfield, the character from the first game. She never finds him, but her focus changes from looking for Chris to protecting Sherry Burkin, the daughter of William, the monster antagonist of the game. She starts the game sort of as a child, the little sister of Chris, but then runs into Sherry and takes up the mantle of protector of Sherry, a kind of motherly figure. My name's Claire. What's yours? Sherry, do you know where your parents are? They both work at the Umbrella Chemical Plant. She grows up rather quickly, completing her character arc by about the middle of the game. Although it is a bit off-topic, Claire's character development is kind of undone by the time of Code Veronica as she goes back to just searching for her brother again. There are a few supporting characters, most importantly Ada and Sherry. Ada appears primarily in Leon's game, a tough woman working undercover to steal a sample of the G-Virus. Her appearance is a callback to the first game, as she was referenced as being the girlfriend of an Umbrella researcher named John. Ada uses that pretense of looking for John as a cover for her search for the G-Virus. This brings her into contact with Leon. As the game progresses, she briefly works alongside Leon simply as a matter of convenience. She eventually comes to have feelings for Leon, and despite betraying him in the Leon A scenario, finds herself unable to shoot him when push comes to shove. Depending on what scenario you are playing, she can either die by being shot by a net falling from a walkway, or being smashed into a wall by the tyrant. This death is unfortunately cheapened by her appearance in the end of the B scenario of either character, as well as her appearance in Resident Evil 4. Her survival is never explained and feels rather lazy. Bit of advice, try using knives next time. Sherry Birkin appears primarily in Claire's story. She is an 11-year-old girl and the daughter of William and Annette Birkin. As opposed to the main characters, which grow up during the course of the game, Sherry kind of goes in reverse. Sherry is an oddly independent girl. Her parents being researched for Umbrella, they have little time to raise her. She was forced to grow up fast and thinks she can take care of herself. Even after she learns to trust Claire, she still runs off, preferring to take care of herself. This is a problem because she is actually way over her head. During gameplay sessions, she is absolutely defenseless and in the story isn't much better off. As the story unfolds, Sherry's infected with a G-parasite forcing her into dependence on Claire. This is the status she retains until the end of the game. Sherry's arc goes backwards from the norm. She starts out as being independent beyond her means, and then turns into a child she always should have been. 
William Birkin is the monster antagonist of the game. His personality is really only seen in a short flashback. In that flashback, he comes across as a shallow, megalomaniacal villain. He is the creator of the G-Virus, and possibly the T-Virus as well. He doesn't want Umbrella to have it. He doesn't really express any interest in doing something else with it, or a reluctance in allowing Umbrella to have such a dangerous bioweapon. He just thinks it belongs to him. After he is shot, he injects himself the virus and turns into a monster. As a monster, I got the impression that William is slowly losing control over his own mind as he mutates. I guess this impression is the result of his human features slowly fading away as he mutates. Eventually, even his head disappears, fading into his body as a separate head sprouts as a replacement. The G-Virus is completely taken over. Still, after mutation, William Birkin does not seem to have any greater motivation beyond reproduction. In that regard, he makes for a weak antagonist. Annette Birkin is the wife of William and the mother of Sherry. Her characterization is all over the place. In one instance, she shows concern for her daughter, but doesn't spend any time looking at Sherry. She tries to avenge William's perceived death, even though she understood that William is already gone. You killed William. I'll never forgive you. Annette doesn't seem to have any goals. She wanders around the sewers for some reason, then goes to the laboratory for some reason. She provides exposition, then acts as an annoyance for the remainder of the game. There are other characters. Kendo is a conditionally creepy guy. Marvin is an exposition machine. And Chief Irons is a raving madman. They don't offer much to the story, but they also don't really need to. The game takes place in the actual Raccoon City instead of a mansion outside of the city featured in the first game. And while the start of the game does take place on the streets, the bulk of the game takes place in a similarly claustrophobic interior to the first game. Although there is an increase in enemy count, the threat of being in the center of a zombie-filled city is not obvious to me. Resident Evil 2 continues the tradition of giving you a limited feeling of empowerment by providing you with powerful weapons, but limited amounts of ammo. However, the increased enemy count necessitated vastly increasing the ammo provided. You are practically showered with ammo in this game. Every room feels like there are multiple cases of ammo just sitting around for no reason. The balance of ammo to enemies is also less refined than the original. Even in my first playthrough, I ended up with significantly more ammo than I needed. Unlike in the first game, the sequel manages to balance the characters out better than the original, however. This is managed by having two characters feature completely different weapon sets. Claire has her Browning HP pistol, bowgun, grenade launcher, and spark shot. Leon has the Heckler and Koch. VP-70 pistol, Remington shotgun, Desert Eagle 50 caliber magnum, and a flamethrower. Both characters not only have different damage values, but also different handling characteristics as well. Bear with me here, because I have to get a little bit into the weeds explaining the differences with weapons. Using a memory scanner on an emulated PlayStation, I observe the health values of enemies and use that to observe the damage values of the weapons. Dispensing with the actual values I observed, which reach into the millions, here I will simplify what I observed by using the pistol damage as a baseline. Please note that the weapons have different damage values depending on what type of enemy they are used on. For this, unless otherwise noted, I will present the damage values against both zombies and lickers. However, the baseline damage will be based on the base pistol damage against zombies. Both Leon and Claire have different pistols, both inflicting the same damage values. They have a value of 1 against zombies and a value of 0.87 against liquors. Note that Claire's pistol only carries 13 rounds compared to Leon's 8. This can be an annoyance requiring more frequent reloading, but it doesn't really make a difference with an experienced player because it can be reloaded while in the game's menu. The knife returns in this game, with both characters featuring a damage value of 0.19 times pistol damage against zombies. 
As with the previous game, the knife, aside from self-imposed challenges, is nearly useless in game, as plenty of ammo is provided. Claire gets a bow gun in Kendo's gun shop. Against zombies, it does 5.62 times pistol damage, and against slickers, it does 3.7 times pistol damage. The bow gun has a mid-range scattershot damage model, so damage is calculated at close range. Leon gets the shotgun in place of Claire's bow gun in Kendo's shop. The shotgun does 5.62 times pistol damage against zombies. Note that aiming against a head at close range will result in an instant kill against zombies. Also, shots against a body may result in bifurcation, removing the zombie from its legs. Against liquors, it has a damage value of 3.125 times pistol damage. The shotgun has a short range scatter shot model, so damage is calculated at very close range. The shotgun can be upgraded to the combat shotgun, which does an amazing 18.74 times pistol damage against zombies, effectively an instant kill in most cases, and 6.88 times pistol damage against liquors. The upgrade is not compulsory and will likely be missed by first time players. Between the two, the shotgun is probably the better weapon, as a stronger knockback on enemies and can conditionally kill zombies in one shot. The upgrade further advances the shotgun and the weapon useful in any situation. Rather early in the game, Claire gains access to the grenade launcher, which has three different types of ammunition. The standard grenade rounds deal 3.75 times pistol damage against zombies and 3.06 times pistol damage against liquors. The grenade rounds have a short range scatter shot, so close range encounters are a must. The acid rounds are essentially a one hit kill against zombies, but I was able to read a damage value of 12.5 times above pi uh, pistol damage, with additional damage slowly accumulating following the shot, which lasts indefinitely until the zombie's death. This was only achieved by giving the zombie an impossibly high health value in the memory scanner so it doesn't really happen in game. Against Lickers, Acid Rounds do 8.13 times pistol damage. I did not notice any additional damage over time against the Lickers. Unlike the Grenade Rounds, the Acid Rounds are long range. Ammo for this weapon is rather rare, however. The Flame Rounds are also a one-hit kill against zombies, with 12.5 times pistol damage against zombies. And, like the acid rounds, additional damage accumulates following the hit, until the zombie's death. Against liquors, flame rounds do 4.36 at times pistol damage, and do not inflict any additional damage from setting the liquor on fire. Flame rounds are long-range weapons, but will not stagger an enemy on hit, making them less useful than the acid rounds. This ammo is a little bit more common than acid rounds, but is still somewhat rare. In comparison, Leon gains access to the Desert Eagle Magnum somewhat later in the game than when Claire gets her grenade launcher. I was unable to get damage data on zombies because it kept crashing the game, but it is one hit kill. Against Slickers, the Magnum does 12.5 times pistol damage. Ammo for this weapon is rather rare, so don't waste it on zombies. The Magnum can be upgraded, provided the player goes through the effort to find the parts late in the game. The upgraded C Magnum is, like the base Magnum, a one-hit kill on zombies. Against Slickers, it does a staggering 18.5 times pistol damage. This upgrade is discovered nearly at the end of the game and is really only useful against the end boss. This upgrade is also not compulsory, and will likely be missed by first-time players. It's arguable which weapon is more useful. Claire has access to her weapon, the grenade launcher, earlier, and has more ammo for it, but does less damage than Leon's Magnum. Claire has access to the Spark Shot. This is a limited usefulness weapon, which has no reloads. It does 3.75 times pistol damage against zombies, and 4.37 times pistol damage against liquors. It's found mid-game, just in time to be used against the Jeep Birkin on the elevator, which is probably the only truly useful application for it. Leon gets the Flamethrower. It, like the Spark Shot, does not have any reloads. 
I have no damage values for this weapon, but it tends to set enemies aflame for accumulating damage, similar to Claire's flame rounds. It is most useful against a few Plant 43 monsters encountered in the late game, but can be used for zombies or the moth monster. I would say that Claire has the advantage here. Claire's weapon is best used against Birkin on the elevator, easing the ammo requirement for her run. Leon's weapon is found later in the game, just in time to be used against the plant monsters, but it just really fills a role in his arsenal that is filled by Claire's flame rounds that she gets a whole lot more of. Both characters can get access to the submachine gun. This weapon does a lowly 0.25 times pistol damage against zombies and 0.68 times pistol damage against liquors. Its low damage output is offset by the high rate of fire and repeated stagger it inflicts on enemies. Beyond weapons, Claire and Leon have different extra items. Claire has the lockpick while Leon has the lighter. Both are useful in various places in the game. Claire can use her lockpick to open desks, which Leon has to locate individual keys for, and also they take up space in his inventory. Leon's lighter is necessary in some puzzles, forcing Claire to find the lighter, which has to sit in her inventory. Both extra items are useful, and it's up to the player preference as to which one is better. Switch character is stronger? Well, provided you follow through and get all the extra weapon upgrades, Leon is. If you don't, Claire is. Unlike the first game where Jill was clearly the easier character to play as, I don't think there is such a cut and dry answer in the sequel. It's up to the player preference as to which one is better. Puzzles follow the trend of the first game, depending on the use of a key or a key-like object to unlock doors. Puzzles make no sense in a police station. I can maybe suppress my incredulity in the first game in this regard. I can imagine some insane eccentric person decided to lock doors with some insane crest stone locking system. I cannot in any way contort logic to believe that a police station is locked up in this manner. If you are not sticking stones in a wall, you're moving bookcases or sticking metals in a machine to stop a flow of water that could easily have been walked through anyway. It is true nonsense. At least the puzzles seem to be easier in this game than its predecessor. As with the first game, the puzzles seem to exist mostly to force the player to explore the map. Voice acting in this game is drastically improved from the first. There is no Master of Unlocking in Resident Evil 2. Dialogue writing, voice acting, and direction are seen. Who are you? What are you doing here? Hold your fire! I'm a human! Don't get me wrong, the voice acting isn't actually any good. It isn't to the standards of modern games, or even the standards set by Metal Gear Solid which was released in the same year. But it is better. I find that Sherry and Williams voice actors provided the worst performances in the game, While Leon's voice actor is probably the best in my opinion, he's not good, just a bit better than the rest. What do I think of Resident Evil 2? Well, I do think it was an improvement over the original in a lot of ways. Although it unfortunately doesn't quite get that same nostalgic pull for me because it wasn't the original. It is also not going to be seen favorably by younger fans who perhaps may have started with the game Resident Evil 4. And it also has a remake released in 2019 which has much more modern design concepts. Resident Evil 2 may not be the best game in the series, the way I remember it when I was a kid. But, if you can manage to look beyond all of the limitations, such as the tank controls and the poor voice acting, the odd puzzle structures and all of that, 
you'll find a real gem here, definitely something worth going back to.